you have your Bibles, if you'd open them to the book of Deuteronomy, where Pastor Eric was alluding to earlier and speaking from. We have begun this idea of reset, and just so that everybody knows, um, quick update, there are still five fish alive. So all that entered last week made it to this week. I'm holding steady five fish and one crawdad. Uh, all is good in the fish tank in my office. We, are, we have effectively, evidently reset and I'm hoping that that maintains. We'll see. The idea of resetting is something that we have been discussing as we've looked to a new year and looked at our lives and said, what does it mean for us to continue to move forward and making sure that we're on the right paths, doing the right things, listening to the right voices, and depending upon the right power? The book of Deuteronomy is where we have found ourselves over the last couple weeks, and as you uh, prepare for this message, I've entitled it Run the Offense it, in light of the couple significant football games this afternoon that will determine who plays in uh, the championship game, otherwise known as the big game for us, but to everyone out there that owns the rights to the name, the Super Bowl. Those teams that play in that game this afternoon to make it there have got to take all the things that they've learned, all the challenges that they've faced, all the adversities, all the lessons, all the plays, and they have to run the offense, and they have to run it well. They've got to score points if they're going to win the game. And as we think about the idea of resetting, we've kind of talked about some of those fundamental things that we need to be and who um, we need to know ourselves are, we are in Christ but the reality is we then have to do something with it. We have to actually run with these truths. Just like I talked about earlier with this idea that there's canceled sin, there's power that exists for the believer living in light of the truth, and so it calls us to action. And so Deuteronomy is Moses' kind of final uh, send-off just before the book of Joshua where they go into the promised land. Moses knows he's not going with them and is declaring these things to them one final time before they go. So I'm going to look at a couple more verses this morning. We're going to make it through verse 9. We're going to read starting in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 9, and then we'll dive into what God has to say. So if you have your place, would you stand with me? As we read from God's Word, starting in verse 1 of chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his state, uh, statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O oh, Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you and that you might multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. And so hear, O oh, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart, and so you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on, the, and on your gates. Let's pray. Father, as we gather in this place, we all come in with all kinds of things happening in our own lives. We gather in this place because we have chosen, and you have brought us here, that we might meet with you. I pray that you would speak. I pray that you would minister to our hearts that the things that we individually need to hear, even as we receive them corporately, that you would apply them to our circumstances and situations. God, that you would not only convict us, 
of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, but you would enable us by your grace to turn and be who you call us to be, supply all that we need to be the individual, to be the families, and to be the church family that this church, that this community, that our homes, that our state, that our nation world need. God, I thank you for this time where we sit under your word. And God, we surrender all of our minds and all of our hearts, all of our emotions, and may it be also our wills to what you'd have to say in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we dive into verse 7, I do want to start just backing up a little bit as I kind of continue on from last time. Verse 6, it's just said, these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. As we look at verse 7, where it's headed in our teaching of it, the first thing I need is to recognize is this. We pass on what we genuinely believe and hold dear. We pass on what we genuinely believe and what we really hold dear. You see, we have to recognize that who we are and what we do with it matters. The beginning of this message in verse 4 where he says, Hear, O Israel, as we look at that, one commentary said that to hear here is tantamount to obey. This is a kind of covenant context that he has. God, if for us to hear God and not obey is not to hear him at all. And so the language of our response is love. It's obedience. It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, the deepest affection, that most willing of desires. Because this is why it matters. If we are going to be people who pass on what we genuinely believe, we have to let that be who we really are. Because out of the overflow, the mouth speaks, right? Luke chapter 6, verse 45. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. The evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. And then he, Jesus says this, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. We speak about the things that we have our affections set on. The King James Version and the New King James, they say, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The overflow of the heart. You see, your faith must be who you are before you're effectively going to transfer it to someone else. This was never more evident than my life than on Friday. On Friday, I was at home, and I have had a problem ever since I uh, built my house with the circuit that's on my front porch. It has continually tripped on me over and over again, and I have, I don't know how many times, honestly, that I have taken apart the receptacles and tried to redo them to make sure that nothing was touching anything, Literally, in one of the receptacles, I took electrical tape and just wrapped it around every single wire in there. Because I was like, I don't know, maybe there's like a slit, and when I push it in, it's bending open, it's arcing, and that's what's causing my problems. So literally, I have been trying everything. My mom shows up one time and goes, well, you know, one time I had a bad uh, light bulb, and when I replaced the light bulb, it stopped tripping. And so I looked at, indeed, one of my light bulbs was bad. I was like, Oh my goodness, my mom has rescued me. I changed out the light bulb. It worked for a day. And I was right back where I was again. And so finally, I was like, I made the call. Registered, licensed, electrician man, come help me. I don't know what to do at this point. I was indeed ready at that point to just wire the whole thing, like just ignore the wires that were already there and just run a whole new wire. And wherever it happened to go, that was what we were going to do. I was just going to start over. But he begins uh, the process with me. Five and a half hours later, we have spent two and a half hours talking about Jesus. Because he's a believer. And I honestly can't keep him on the task because he knows I'm a pastor. And so he's just eating it up. I mean, he is just talking to me all about this, about Jesus, all about this, all about this. And, this. I mean, and he's just telling me, I mean, I know his story. I know everything about the man. I know where he's come from. I know he's done. I know, I mean, all of, I, I know it. But let me tell you, what I know is that man loves Jesus. 
and he loves to talk about him. He loves to serve him. And eventually, we got around to electric. And he knows the stuff over there too. I hope. For two days, it hasn't tripped. We decided it was a bad breaker, which means that all of my placing of my wires and all that kind of stuff was for naught. It wouldn't have mattered. But we went ahead and took out a couple extra receptacles, switched them out for ones so that maybe it's just a reset. And indeed, it has held. Visionaries, visionaries of companies, well, the reason that makes them so successful is because they point to the vision over and over again. It's because it's who they are. They're so impassioned about it that everywhere they go, that's all they talk about. That's all they can think about. And so it just rubs off on all the people that work with them, and they buy in, and they're inspired by the things that this visionary has owned for himself or herself, and it just can't help but be the embodiment of. The converse is when you are trying to do something that is not natural, that isn't in line with the things that you value. I remember in, uh, when I was teaching in Fleming County that we had a situation where, uh, you know, we get rules from the administration and we have to follow those rules. And every teacher, I mean, I would hear it, right, because it was cell phones was the discussion. What to do with the cell phones with the students. And the rule was from up top, no cell phones out. But every student could tell you That teacher doesn't care, and so you can have it out. That teacher does care. That teacher only cares during this time. That teacher does this. I'm getting nodding heads over here from my own daughter. Kind of harder when you don't own it. When we're trying to pass on our faith, if we don't own it, and it's not genuine, it's not going to go very far. We're going to have a hard time trying to live it out ourselves, much less give it to others. You see, if if we are to pass things along, we must own them first. We only pass on what we genuinely believe. Our lives need to be the developing display of the truth we teach. So think about this for just a second. I, I want to free you for a little moment here. The idea or the reality is we may not have yet arrived where we want to arrive. But those who watch us should see us trying to apply the same principles that we espouse. Right? So being a Christian and trying to teach the next generation or trying to pour into someone else doesn't mean that you've already attained perfection in all of those things. Indeed, that's what Paul says. I have not yet obtained that. Yet forgetting what is behind, I press on, right? But yet, in the same time, he says, follow me, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so there's this call that you're not to be, you're not expected to have it all together before you start. Because indeed, I would argue that you actually learn as you go through that. What we believe is what people see, regardless of what we say. So it really matters that this thing sinks in. We can say anything, but it's what our lives scream that people hear. So let me ask you some questions. Right? Do you, what do you believe about our, the way we interact with Scripture? How often should we read it? And the question is, how often do you engage Scripture and do you read it? And what do you believe about prayer? How often and how should you be participating in it? How are you doing at that? What do you believe about evangelism? Who, what, how, when should be times where you're sharing that? When was the last time you were able to share the gospel message? What about giving? If everyone gave like you gave, what would be the state of the church? What about discipleship? If every home followed how you taught and how you passed along Scripture to the next generation, where would Christianity be in 20 years? You see, in general, if you were the model of our faith and everyone was like you, would our church be growing spiritually, numerically? Would it be financially strong? Would it be vibrant in worship? Would it be a blessing to God and to this community? And hear me, if the answer is yes, keep doing it because we need the models. But when we go to teach, 
the way we live is being checked. Over this past year, we've had lots of circumstances that have revealed things about our beliefs and our faith. How important is being together as the body of Christ? How important is it to honor others and one another and the divinely placed leadership given us? How important is tithing even amidst turmoil and unknown? How important is being here? You know, I, I, I pray that we are able to be consistent people. You know, when I, when I look out and I hear of people or I see people out, but then they tell me, well, I don't want to be at church right now because of COVID. I'm going, but you value this so you'll do it. And it teaches us, it shows us, it's a mirror to know what we value in all of the things that we do. And I'm not saying that attendance is everything, but are you consistent across the board? Because we do what we want to do. We want to have the vacation. We're going we're to figure out how to have a vacation. We'll take the risk. We want to see our grandkids play. We'll go take the risk. Whatever it happens to be. One thing I would, I'm grateful for, the Carol and Ann nicely, they, they, they're coming to the 8 a.m. service in the morning. I, I, I love those ladies. They are ladies that have just a joy, and they love being here, and this is their family. And it broke their heart when we were virtual. I mean, they're just like, man, we, this is us. And she said, I know I'm 80, whatever she is. She said, but this is where I'm at because this is my faith family. And they just come with joy. I'm grateful for people like that, that teach me in the way they live that out. We pass on what we genuinely believe and hold dear. Because that's who we are. It's what we talk about. It's what we invest our lives in. And so which is more important? Is it teaching our kids how to do chores at home or to engage their faith? I would say academics, chores, all of those things are important. They're not unimportant. But if they're important and you spend time doing them, how much do you spend time doing the other as well to show its importance? Because we can't kid ourselves. No one, no one, especially our kids and our wives or husbands that watch us 24-7 will ever be fooled. We pass on what we genuinely believe and hold dear. So let's now talk about how we pass that on. Second thing I want you to see is this. Training up generations in the faith is a family-led ministry. Training up generations in the faith is a family-led ministry. Notice how verse 7 starts. You shall teach them. Notice what Moses doesn't say. Moses does not say, bring them to me and I'll take care of it for you. Moses doesn't say, bring them to church, bring them to the expert, bring them to vacation Bible school on Wednesday nights. Now, those are important resources, and they can be helpful, but they are never to be primary. This is what is taught in Scripture over and over and over again. Notice, no parent, no grandparent, no spiritual person has an excuse or an exemption in this matter. Everyone is to be teaching. This is not higher mathematics. This is not science. This is not band. This is God. And guess what? Every one of you has a theology whether it's biblical or not, you are accountable for that theology and to pass it on. And you might say, well, I can't. I'm not comfortable doing that. I'm not good at doing that. But can I be truthful that most of the time when I'm doing that, it's because I want to protect myself, my pride, and my own ego. Because I don't want to look bad. I don't want to sound dumb. I don't want to know what I don't know what I, I don't want to show that I don't know what I'm doing. Which was a mouthful to even show. But yet, this is what God's predetermined plan is for the propagation of biblical truth. Now, for some, that might scare the snot out of you. I understand that. You might say and look to me and say, look, I'm over my head. It's just not me. I will get them here, but you've got to teach them the spiritual stuff. 
Well, here's the good news. You're in good company. Because there was a guy named Moses that I read about this past week. And you know what? Moses was 40 years living in Egypt, then blew it, went out into the wilderness, was living for another 40 years. God comes to him at the age of 80, says, I've heard the cries of my people back in Egypt. He goes, oh, yep, uh, I tried that when I was 40. Sorry about that. Yes, they should have been out by now, but God says, yeah, so I'm going to send you. He goes, whoop, nope. Asked some questions, and he finally, finally runs out of things to ask. He says, okay, but look, Lord, I can't, I can't speak well. I have a problem speaking. I, I stutter. It's a, I, you know I don't speak well. I, how could I go to favor? I, I, look at me, God, I'm babbling right now. That's in the unabridged version. And guess what God does? God, God says, you know what? Your brother Aaron speaks well. He's going to come and he's going to meet you. And you're going to go to Egypt. <laughs> he doesn't say, oh, that's right, you can't speak well. Never mind, I'll just go talk to Aaron. I'll get it worked out. When they come, you can join them. No, he sends Moses back. And so he gives him an errand. He gives him a, a help. But he doesn't take the responsibility off of Moses. Moses, you will go and you will be God to Pharaoh. And you will speak to Aaron the things that I have commanded. And they will look to you and they will respond. And so Moses is the one who goes. And if God doesn't give him an out, he doesn't give us an out either. God gave you your family for a reason. He gave each child to you for a reason. He is equipping and preparing you for with those reasons in mind. And He has given us this faith family, which means He's given us errands all around. But He hasn't taken the responsibility off of our plates. Ultimately, accountability is ours to shoulder in our families. You shall teach them. You shall teach them diligently. Diligently. A definition. Having or showing care or conscientiousness in one's work or duties. Someone who is diligent works hard and carefully, quietly and steadily, persevering especially in detail and exactness. Characterized by care and perseverance in carrying out tasks, careful and using lots of effort. To be diligent is not to be passive, it is to be active. It is not to be half-hearted but fully engaged. It is not to be easy, it is to recognize that it may be hard. It is not maybe going to be convenient, but it must be persistent. The New Living Translation, I like how it, it takes that uh, verse and uh, translates it as, repeat them again and again to your children. The NIV says, impress them on your children. Take these things. In fact, that's probably the closest of the right definitions because the word in Hebrew that I have translated, teach them diligently, teach and diligently is actually one word in the Hebrew. We just have to use two to convey the strength and the magnitude of that word. And so it translates teach them diligently, but the Hebrew word is really just one word. It's to impress and instill. It's inscribing them with an indelible sharpness and precision. One commentary said this, The image that is brought here is that of an engraver of a monument who takes the hammer and the chisel in hand and with painstaking care etches a text into the face of a solid slab of granite. The sheer labor of such a task is daunting indeed. But once done, the message is there to stay. This is the imagery that we have here of teaching them diligently. It's to impress it in them so that it leaves the mark. That it stays with them afterwards. Teach them diligently. You do that work. 
But notice what it says how to do that work. Going on, verse 7. It talks about sitting and lying and walking and rising up. Third point I want you to see is this. Because our faith is to be all-encompassing in our own lives, then the call to pass it on is also all-encompassing. Verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your son. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Notice this constant, this kind of repetition back and forth, sitting at home on the path while you're away, when you lie down, when you get up. You see the contrast of these things. They're opposites, which is to include all of the in between, which means the full breadth and scope of all activity. Moses is basically saying, all your labors and all your times, this should be part of what you are doing. It is to be the ethos of your home and of your life. You are are a constant lesson, and you are a constant reminder of the truths that you hold. This is not segmented. This is not secular versus sacred. This is everything. It is not parsed out. It is all the time. Here's a check. How you act at home, how you talk at home, how you serve at home. These should be consistent across the board with how you do those same things outside the home. Because the lessons that are being seen are always being taught, whether directly or indirectly, by everyone around you. But I want you to notice something in this passage because I I didn't see it at first and I've thought about this a little bit more and that verse 7 says you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them it's actually two commands like at first I kind of thought oh you shall teach them by talking about it all the time but it's actually two different things teach and talk now what what does that mean what does that infer here's what I kind of see I think we know this intuitively. Discipleship is both taught and caught. It's two parts. There's more than just sitting down and espousing truth. There should be some of both. We should have times where intentionally we're engaging in both. Sometimes direct instruction and sometimes indirect instruction. Sometimes it's preventative instruction, teaching worldview and theology. Sometimes it should be reactionary based on things that are going on. One is more static. It's pre-planned. It's kind of general, foundational things that we should know. This is what the women on uh, Friday nights are doing. They're looking at kind of a systematic theology. They're looking at what does the Bible say about Scripture? What does the Bible say about this, about that? And they're getting that foundational work together. But it, I mean, yes, they're going to apply it to their lives, but at the same time, they're just trying to figure out what are those things that form our foundation. But on the other side of that is that we have this opportunity to be in this word because it engages the realities of life. And so when we get to get together and talk at the dinner table or wherever it happens to be, there's a a dynamic aspect that comes out as we relate work and school and the White House and everything else through a biblical worldview. And we take opportunity to nurture and to teach in that context and so sometimes we're just working at the truth and we're just learning truth and then other times we're looking at the things that are going on around us and saying what have we gained over here that we can apply over here and make it make sense and come together and teach us how we are to respond both of these are necessary i will tell you though i am i probably struggle right now in my season of life with the teaching side of things when my, um, when my kids were young, and I had less of them, I remember when I would get Joshua up from bed and get him up in the morning, and before school, I'd bring him down, I'd sit him right next to me, and I had this devotional book, and I'd read it with him each morning. We would read through, and then Lauren kind of got old enough, and she came down, and she would sit down with me. Do you even remember doing this? So they were young, and we'd read through this, Lauren, I, I don't know how much she caught because it was probably more directed at Joshua, a little older. But this is how we were doing it. Well, then I had the third child and a fourth and a fifth. And then they started, like, 
waking up at different times in the morning because there was different buses coming. So right now, like, right now we have two that wake up at 6.10, two that wake up at 6.40-ish, and one that we get up around 7.15. All different kinds of times. Now we have one that works, one that's in uh, track, one that's uh, doing, still doing karate, one that does uh, tennis. I'm all over the place. But guess what I realized from Scripture? It's not an excuse. I'm still called to teach my kids. And maybe we do the, the indirect talking about a lot, but how much am I just sitting down and saying, no, oh, let's get this down together so that when we go talk about it, we've got some meat to apply. And so I have to say, I, I'm trying to figure out that new normal in my life and do that well. And there's all the distractions of life, which is, I think, exactly why the next verse is there. I think, God knows me. Moses knows the people of Israel. Like, we need the next verse. Because it says, all right, you shall bind them as signs on your hands, and they shall be on the, as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Here's what I know. We've got to do what it takes to keep discipleship at the front and center. And Moses and God know that this is hard for us to do because of all the things that are going on in our lives. It's not easy. And so he says, so do what you've got to do to keep it in front of you. Bind them, write them. Keep them there to remind you that as you leave the house for the day or that you return home from the evening that God is the God of the world. Keep it there continually to affect you by its remembrance. Keep it there so other things don't fill that void. Keep it there so that you're not just actively holding your ground, but you're moving the team forward. This idea of doing this is over and over again in Scripture. In Exodus chapter 13, again, last week's reading, which I was reading, they celebrate the Passover. And as they celebrate that, then God says to him, you shall tell your sons, or Moses says to the people, you shall tell your sons on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall serve as a sign for you on your hand and as a reminder on your foreheads that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a powerful hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18. Moses says, You shall therefore impress these words of mine on your heart and on your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hands, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. The same language. Exodus 13, when there's another circumstance that happens, and he says, and so this shall serve as a sign on your hand and as phylacteries on your forehead. And then I read the New Living Translation of it, and it talked about this ceremony will be like a mark branded on your hand and on your forehead. Because I was sitting there going, man, I've got to get a lot of tattoos. And I'm going to have to get one of those signs that are, that are backwards, right, so that when I look in the mirror, I can read it, and everybody else looks to be funny. Right? And that's what I got to do. I got to keep this ahead of me. I got to keep this around me. But then I read that and said this ceremony should be like a mark. So I thought, oh, wait a minute, this is bigger. It's not just literally put it all over my hands and over my forehead. So some religious people do. But it's also what I do. There are ceremonies, there are different events that I can participate in, i.e., coming to church on a Sunday morning is a great reminder of those very things. That call me back to remembering the things that I may have forgotten over the past week or the work of life and the struggles of life gotten a little dirty and messy in the midst of it and I'm able to shed those things back and remember that my sin is canceled before Christ and I have power. Or whatever it is that I need to hear that morning that God would bring to me through His Word. So what it is is it's an intentionality in remembering. Yesterday morning, my wife, made me watch this YouTube video on the Shabbat. And so this is for Hasidic Jews. They're kind of the legalistic kind of Jews. So on Friday evenings, if you're a Hasidic Jew, on Friday evening, 
just before dusk, you light three candles or however many candles you may have to your family, and that starts the, the Sabbath. And that goes until Saturday night when you can see three stars in the sky. I guess that means it's dark enough that you can stop because you know that, you know that the day is over. I think it's three stars just because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they just don't know it yet. But we got to watch, and they, this guy got permission to participate in it. And he got to talk to them about this event. And yes, there were rituals and, and different things involved, but the guy talked about how great it was being forced every week to do this Shabbat. He talked about, man, you know, one of the realities was because it was such a hard stop, they had to do it. Like, he remember, like they try every week to be home, make sure they're every single Friday night, they're back home. So he would fly and he would be away, but he would fly back on Friday so he was there, and then he would take back off on Sunday and go back and do his work. But he was there for that time. There's only a few times in his life that he was remembered not being there. And he celebrated it by himself in his room, in his quarters. And it's really crazy. Like, they're not allowed to turn on a light switch. Like, they, they can't do anything like that. So, like, he, the guy told me, he said, or it, it was in the video, he said, if we don't have the light on in the bathroom and the door open, then we don't get to use that, that, that one's off limits. Because we can't go in there. It's like, wow, this is intense, right? They're not allowed to do any work. So they brought a maid in and took care of the things that they needed. I guess the non-Jews are allowed to do it, but they're not. This is the legalism of it all, right? But what he said was, he said, but because we knew that every Friday night, that's what's going on. Guess what? There was no fighting, no bickering. It was a hard stop. And everybody knew it. So what he said was, and so we don't get out of the routine. Because you can't. You can't say, oh, I made, I, I, this, this reason for this excuse this time. But we'll get back into it. But then that becomes, oh, man, we'll get around to it. Man, I just haven't got a chance to get to it because I've got all these other things that I've got to do. And I know that when we read that we, or we hear that, we go, oh, my goodness, that's legalism. That's such hard legalism. We're grace people. They're Old Testament people. They live like that. Oh, we're, we're New Testament people, Jesus. And I hear that. Man, I also think there's some really good wisdom in it. Because we need reminders. And we need things that will focus us. And if that needs to be a hard stop so we just give it up, then so be it. So that we have our, our hearts and minds attuned to what matters. They literally unplug from everything. No cell phones, no interactions with anything. They just stay at the house. The guy told of his grandfather, who every Friday got fired from his job and rehired on Monday. Because I guess he had to work on Saturdays and he could never do it because of the Shabbat. And so every Friday they fired him. But because he was such a good worker, they hired him every Monday. And he brought home the pink slips and actually decorated a wall with them just to demonstrate the sacrifice that they were willing to do to keep it. So often I think we just kind of say, I'll get to it. Yeah, I know those things are important, but we don't actually do it. Hear, O Israel. O Israel, that you would hear these things and do them. It's what Moses is saying to the people. So I want to encourage you to do something in response. I'll give you just a couple things. One I want to kind of announce that we're, we're going to try some errand things for you. In February, we're starting back up with Wednesday nights. We haven't done Wednesday nights since last March when we shut down. We're going to start back up on Wednesday nights. At the end of Ju uh, February, we're going to launch a family-led um, initiative here that we're going to help you disciple and minister to your families at home or in a context that is appropriate. And I know that everybody doesn't have young children. But we're going to find ways we can get all of us connected in this. As we think about that, 
I want to invite you to kind of plan towards being a part of that. Say, okay, Lord, how do I do that? How do I live that out? Like we're called to be passing this on. If this is what the Word says, God, help me to do that, not to live in excuses or to say I'll get there sometime or life is just crazy right now, I can't. But to say, okay, God, this is important and I will be there. The other thing is this, I, I'm going to ask my kids and my wife, because we just, got, we just built a house, right? So we have nothing on the walls except for two, two things. I think there's two things, three things. There's three things in our kitchen. There's two things like on the dining area, and we stuck one thing up there um, above the pantry. And yet we don't have like really, it, it's a big deal for me to put something on the wall. I mean, do you know how hard you have to work to keep those things without dents and dings and all that? I mean, I mean I, I'm constantly, like, it's like just seeing spots where I got a drywall fix and I got to paint it again because some Nerf gun did this or that. And so, I, man, when I commit to a screw or a nail, it's a big deal. But what I also know is, man, that's, a, that's one way we could apply this passage is to actually take it literally because we don't really have a lot of stuff on our walls yet. And so some of you guys may have some scripture that you've put up in different places, but I would encourage you to think, how could I this week put something up as a memorial to the truth that I know? Now, I, I would encourage you maybe even to think, like uh, the master bedroom, what's something that you could stick in there about the, the sanctity of marriage and the holiness of marriage, right, and honoring one another? Maybe something to go there. Now, what you don't need to do is go into your bathroom and do what uh, a guy posted yesterday on Facebook. He went into this Christian establishment in the bathroom. They had scripture, you know, all over the place. But right above the toilet, it said, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I don't know if that was encouraging the young children. Yes, you can pee inside that little circle. It is a challenge at times, evidently. But that may not be the best place for that verse. But what it, maybe what's a favorite verse of each child, of each person in your home, that you can let that be in their room and they can share the significance of it with the family? What are ways that you can actually do something in relation to this so that your minds and your hearts are attuned to the one who we proclaim to be the God of our lives. I know we want those two things to be consistent and congruent. We don't want them to say one thing and live another because it, it tears us up inside. No one wants to live separate. They, man, I want to be able to lay my head down at the end of the night saying the things that I believe are the things that I've just lived. That may be just recognizing that I can't do any of it and my source is all him. But I want to be consistent in that. So I want to challenge you to do the same thing. What is a way you can get it? Maybe not on your hands, maybe not on your forehead, but maybe on your house or your post so that you can remember truth. This is the message that we have. It's time to run the offense it's time to move forward and do what we know we're called to do by the power of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word that continues to speak. I thank you for the call to reset our lives and to invest in the things that we would say are most important. But sometimes just so many things just distract us that we've lost our focus. I thank you that you, you know that we're easily prone to, to lose our focus. And so you tell us to do like crazy things like write scripture everywhere. You've been telling your people that since Exodus. I thank you for that. Because you know me. You know all the things that we face. You know what 2020 was. You know what 2021 has been and will be. And yet the command stays the same. That the gospel continues to get transferred from one generation to another faithfully. Because the church shall not 
have its gates prevailed upon. It shall remain. God, may it be strong and healthy here because we take your word and we give ourselves to it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.